continue our reflection on the commandments today, beginning at, uh, with the Eighth Commandment. We're going to begin to speak about the Eighth Commandment today, which is you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Since Christ commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves, we see that in Matthew, Mark 12, verse 31, we know that, well, I don't like it when people lie to me, so I shouldn't lie to them, if you want to put it in very simple blue-collar terms. The Catechism speaks of this commandment extensively in paragraphs 2464 through 25813. Paragraph 2464 gives a summary. It says the Eighth Commandment forbids misrepresenting the truth in our relations with others. This moral prescription flows from the vocation of the holy people to bear witness to their God who is the truth and wills the truth. Offenses against the truth expressed by word or deed or refusal to commit oneself to moral uprightness. They are fundamental infidelities to God, and in this sense they undermine the foundations of the covenant, says the Catechism. So in our words and in our actions, we're called to be truthful to others. God is the source of all truth. The psalmist says to the Lord, he says, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances endures forever. Psalm 119, verse 160. So since God is truth itself, as we read in the Catechism, paragraph 215, and we are his adopted till children, then he wants us to live in the truth and to testify to the truth. He wants his children to be like him, essentially any good parent would want that. The most common word for truth in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word emet. It's where we actually get the word amen from. So when the priest says to you during communion, body of Christ, you respond by saying what? Amen. You're saying, yes, that's true. It really is the body of Christ. If you say that, but you don't really believe it, then you're not living in the truth. St. John the Evangelist, in his gospel, tells us that Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. John 1, 14, that he came to testify to the truth. John 18, 37, that he, in fact, is the truth. John 14, verse 6. And Jesus promises us, his followers, that the truth does what? Set you free, he says, John 8, 32. He promises also that the Holy Spirit will sanctify us in the truth. John 17, 17. If the truth sets us free and sanctifies us, then it's lies that keeps us slaves to sin and keeps us from growing in holiness. Lies which come from the father of lies, as Jesus calls the devil in John 8, 44. The Catechism at paragraph 24, 67 says that man tends by nature toward the truth. He's obliged to honor and bear witness to to it. So God created us for the truth. Our mind searches for what is true, our will desires what is good. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. So again, when I embrace the truth, I'm embracing reality. For example, a man is a male human being. A woman is a female human being. To acknowledge that is to embrace the truth. To deny those basic truths means that, well, to put it gently, you're not in touch with reality. Again, the Catechism at that same paragraph, 2467, says, It is in accord with their dignity that all men, because they are persons, are both impelled by their nature and bound by a moral obligation to seek the truth, especially religious truth. They are also bound to adhere to the truth once they come to know it, and direct their whole lives in accordance with the demands of truth." Unquote. That's from the Vatican II document on human dignity, dignitatis humanae. So the most important truth that we're bound to seek out and embrace is religious truth. Why is that? Because that explains who we are, why we're here, what we ought to do, how we ought to live, what our ultimate destiny is, who God is, how we are to honor Him, how we are to treat others. Religious truth talks about the most important truths in life. If you don't have the answer to those questions, 
then all the other questions in life are pretty much pointless. They're pretty much meaningless and empty. Vanity of vanities, as Goeleth says in the book of Ecclesiastes, right? For example, if someone tries to debate you or argue you with you about whether birth control or homosexuality or transgenderism are wrong, you should take maybe the conversation a step back and ask them, well, how do you determine if anything's right or wrong? How do you determine if anything's good or evil? How do you know the difference? If you scratch below the surface, you'll find a lot of people who embrace the secularist culture, nowadays referred to as the woke culture. A lot of them are just moral relativists. They don't believe in objective truth to begin with. So arguing with them about right or wrong on a certain issue might not go too far. So you have to acknowledge the existence of objective truth before arguing about whether this or that is true or good or evil. Probably shared this with you before, but G.K. Chesterton, he explained it in this way. He said that, for the pagan, joy is something peripheral and sorrow is something central to their life. Why? Well, because the fundamental, most important questions of life remain unanswered for them. But they're very good at all the secondary questions in life, all the things that aren't as important. They tend to be immersed in those things. But for the Christian, he said, joy is something central and sorrow is something peripheral. Joy is, or at least should be, central to our lives because we know the answer to life's ultimate questions. Whereas sorrow comes in maybe because we don't have the answers to all the secondary questions or issues in life. That's Chesterton's perspective. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Paragraph 2468 of the Catechism says, Truth as uprightness in human action and speech is called truthfulness, sincerity, or candor. Truth or truthfulness is the virtue which consists in showing oneself true in deeds and truthful in words and in guarding against duplicity, dissimulation, and hypocrisy, unquote. So duplicity, hypocrit hypocrisy, dissimulation, they all have to do with putting on a false appearance, appearing one way but in reality being something else. That really is a terrible way to live when you think about it. God doesn't want that for anyone. God is truth. Even his name reveals that too. I am that I am, or I am who I am, he says to Moses in Exodus 3, 14. God is who he is. He's not deceptive, not duplicitous, not two-faced. He's honesty and truth. There are some people, though, who appear one way in public, but in private, in their heart of hearts, they're another way, almost another person because of trauma or wounding that's happened to them. Certainly, those people do need compassion and understanding. They need the Lord's healing as well. I wouldn't put them so much in the category of people who are duplicitous or, hypocr or hypocritical. It's not typically a problem of bad will for them. It's more a problem of a wounded heart or wounded spirit. Lastly, for today, the Catechism says at paragraph 2469, the virtue of truth gives another his due. Truthfulness keeps to a just mean, so it keeps to a middle ground between what ought to be expressed and what ought to be kept secret. It entails honesty and discretion, says the Catechism. Translation, we need to be truthful with others, but we don't have to tell everyone everything. So you do have a right to privacy, too. Not everyone has a right to know everything about you or about what you do or about what you think on everything. We only say that because we know some people get scrupulous about this. They're not sure what to do. Someone asks you a personal question and either you don't feel comfortable sharing that information with them or you can't share that info with them or you just don't think it's appropriate or a good idea to share it with them. Some people, as we know, are kind of like the National Enquirer, right? They think they have the right to know everything about us, and they ask everything, every kind of personal question. If you don't want to share something, you can tell someone, well, I'd prefer not to speak about that, or, well, it's kind of personal, or it's probably better for me not to talk about that, or something to that effect. 
something where the other person can finally get the hint. You know, that some good people struggle with not telling others the full truth about everything. And I usually tell them that. I said, well, I usually say, well, not everyone needs to or has the right to know everything about everything. The Catechism at number 2492 says, everyone should observe an appropriate reserve concerning persons' private lives. And the, pat and excuse me, the Catechism at number 2489 says, the good and safety of others respect for pri privacy and the common good are sufficient reasons for being silent about what ought to be known, ought not to be known, or for making use of a discreet language. No one is bound to reveal the truth to someone who does not have the right to know it, unquote, says the Catechism. So some people you have to tell pretty much everything to other people, maybe a lot of people. You don't have to do that with them. Use discretion, says the Catechism. If people get mad at you for not spilling out your guts to them, that's their problem, right? Uh, pray that God will enlighten them on that or that he'll help them to be more understanding and maybe less nosy. So let's ask Our Lady who always lived and rejoiced in the truth. Let's ask her for the grace to live in the truth as well so that we can reflect the character of our loving God who is truth itself. Praise be Jesus and Mary now and forever. forever.